Handeri rai, handeri rai, handeri rai, ya, handeri rai, handeri rai, handeri rai, ya, 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 handeri rai, handeri rai, handeri rai, ya, 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 handeri rai, handeri rai, handeri rai, ya, 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 handeri rai, handeri rai, handeri rai, ya, 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 Hello, beautiful friends. Wonderful to see you at our last class of the 40 session on the pearls of kindness. Zri Zut, as you know, next week we start our first session on 40 great philosophers, 40 great philosophers and how Judaism can respond or engage with them. Very excited. Hope you will join us on that. We're going to run through um, really fascinating thinkers and um and engage with their biggest and most noble ideas. <clears throat> but before we get there, we want to close out our kindness class. And I look forward in our conversation after this session. Um, I look forward to not only talking about this topic, but you know, um, hearing some takeaways that people are sitting with questions or thoughts or challenges that as they relate to um as they relate to. Um, you know, infusing kindness in our lives in the deepest sense. And so um, our topic today is Zrizut, being quick to act on what's right. Once we know what's right, how can we be quick to act? So let's start with a little question here. How fast do I act? Option one, I move way too quickly and rush all the time. <laughs> Option two, I am very intentional on when to act quickly and when to act slowly. Option three, I'm way too slow to act. <laughs> I know it's hard to generalize as always, but would be great to hear if you were to choose one, what you would choose for you. 13% say I'm way too quick and rush all the time. 13% say I'm way too slow to act. And we've got 75% of like Zen master gurus who just know when to act quickly and know when to act slowly, when to just lay calmly on your surfboard on the ocean and when to paddle because there's a wave coming. Um, and I love that. And that is um, a big part of wisdom in, in life, when, when, when to run and when to walk. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, friends. And this is in a uh, spirit of Pesach because Pesach is the holiday when we move quick. We have to get out of Egypt. You got to get up and go, right? There's no wasting time here. So we know how important it is to infuse chesed into our everyday lives. We also know that there are many barriers, physical, financial, psychological, spiritual, preventing us from doing this. One of our best tools to overcome those barriers is zrizut, alacrity. When we know something is right, we should potentially move fast because something gets in our way. Living with alacrity and diligence will help us to achieve our goals in fostering more acts of kindness in our lives. The Talmud teaches over here in Pesachim, as we said, Zrizut is a, is a category of Pesach, of Passover. It says over here, Zrizin makdimin la mitzvot, the alacritous person, the alacritous perform mitzvot as early as possible, as it states, Abraham awoke early in the morning. So, so here we see the idea of Zrizut as get up early in the morning. Now, I don't want to uh, push any of you if some of you are late sleepers and stay up late at night. I know there is um, some people say the most brilliant people stay up late at night and sleep late. I don't, I don't know if that's you know true or not. But And they also, brilliant people have messy offices. So those are validating for people who stay up late and have messy offices. I like a clean office and I like to get up early in the morning. <laughs> so I guess I'm not in the brilliant category, but I am in the in the Zrizu category of let's get up and go. And so Avraham, the first Jew, um, was a model of this, the Talmud says. He got up early to, to take to, to take care of business. The Talmud explains that this is the reason for the minhag, the custom of performing a brit milah, circumcision, early in the morning. Of course, circumstances such as the, the, the moil is not available earlier may dictate waiting to perform the brief until later in the day. But that is the reason why, if there's mul multiple mitzvot in the morning, we try to do brit milah first, right? Before we read Megillah, before we, you know, pray this or that, we want to do brit milah right away, um, you know, in the spirit of Abraham, who went right away. The Talmud further provides an example of Zrizut as not only a minhag, a custom, but an obligatory mitzvah, 
<clears throat> says over here in, in the in the Talmudic tractate of Ketubot, if one's bread was baked and his animal slaughtered and his wine diluted and the father of the groom or the mother of the bride died before the wedding, one moves the corpse into a room and the bride and groom are brought to the wedding canopy. And the groom engages in intercourse of mitzvah with the bride, and the corpse is buried. And the groom observes the seven days of the feast, and therefore he observes the seven days of mourning. So very interesting how they want to kind of uh, push things uh, forward. Um, and a big part of Zrizut is cert most certainly connected to burial. We want to bury the body as fast as possible. Now, some people misunderstand that. In, in my view, especially in the Haredi world, where they rush to do it immediately, where family can't even get there in time. You know, you got to let family get there, right? But, but bracketing that amount of time, you want to do it as quick as possible. The idea of burying seven days after or five days later is not a, a traditional Jewish approach. We want to do it as fast as we can. For, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lazaro, the Ramchal teaches, there's two components to promptness one before the action and one during its performance. Before the action, one should make sure not to delay performing a mitzvah. <clears throat> Rather, when the time comes or when the opportunity arises or the thought crosses one's mind, one should quickly act and one should not allow time to pass. Promptness during performance means that once one has begun performance, one should quickly complete it, not for the purpose of removing the burden, but out of fear that one may not complete the task. Right, so there's the zrizut of going from thought to action, but then the zrizut also within the action to kind of get it done. Right, if we're going to do something good, let's do it. Let's not give it time where all these barriers are going to get in the way. Um, and that's you know <laughs> one trend for better and worse in the nonprofit world that has emerged is a lot of surveys and a lot of um, research and a lot of data collection and a lot of reporting. And there's a lot of good good there of kind of professionalizing and learning the best from the business world towards the nonprofit realm. And there's a lot of bad, a lot of distractions, a lot of like unnecessary procedures that sometimes bog down just the good that people want to do. Now, of course, not everything should be rushed. There is a danger to rushing, of course. Urchot Sadikim teaches, although promptness is very positive, one should make sure not to rush in one's work too much. One who rides a horse too quickly is likely to get hurt, and one who re runs very quickly will fall. One cannot complete a task properly if it's rushed. Doing something properly requires patience. This is why our rabbi stated, be patient in judgment. Promptness is to be awake, alert, and ready to act, but never to rush what one is doing. These issues require great wisdom to determine when one should act quickly and when one should, should act with patience. Further, there's something to say for gradualism rather than quick change. Consider this verse in the Exodus narrative. It happened when Pharaoh sent out the people that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, because it was near. For God said, perhaps the people will reconsider when they see a war and they will return to Egypt. See, Kikarovhu, it says here, that in this 40-year journey in the desert, God didn't show them the shortcut because it was near, which is to say sometimes shortcuts don't serve us, right? And so there could have been a shortcut to the promised land rather than wandering for 40 years. But God didn't want a shortcut. God wanted a long journey. You know, it is interesting, though, um, when we think about when we have the privilege of time and when we don't, when we sit in a privileged spot, we may feel we have more time, right? Like. If you're in a, a very climate-affected uh, area, you might feel we have less time to deal with climate change. If you're kind of wealthy and live in an area that's less affected, you might feel like, you know what, I, 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 you know, I've got some time. Um, and lo lots of cases like that in regards to when we can be patient and when not. We might say, right, when we want social change, you have to be patient. Every social change movement has a long-term process that has to be be embraced for to have systemic sustainable change and then there's other issues we don't can't afford the time we can't afford to wait on on, on many things um and the same is true of course with health there are some health issues that are about the long term 
daily exercise, daily sleep, you know, nutrition. And then there's things that require immediate intervention, um, you know, and so that's true with lots of things. Uh, and also it's true with um, uh, education and pedagogy, of course. There are things with young children that require just a long-term approach on how we're going to instill certain values. And there's other things that need an immediate and, and stern and direct intervention, right, to make sure that a child is not going on the wrong path. And when do we take the long-term approach in an educational intervention and when the short-term approach? Anyways, it says over here in this verse, because it was near, apparently God rejected the quick, short path because it was near. A longer journey was needed. Maimonides teaches that this was because the Israelites, having just been freed from Egypt, had a slave mentality. And slaves are not equipped to handle sovereignty, right? You have to get rid of slave mentality until, before you have sovereignty. Um, Michael Walzer writes about this. He says, for a sudden transition from one opposite to another is impossible. It is not in the nature of man that after having been brought up in slavish service, that he should all of a sudden wash his hands of the dirt of slavery. God used a gracious ruse in causing the people to wander perplexedly in the desert until their souls became courageous and until moreover people were born who were not accustomed to humiliation and servitude and so that's um you know worth extending to our contemporary moments as well of like what does it mean for the powerless to quickly gain power what does it look like for a social change process that removes the a culture of entitlement a culture of slave mentality, um, you know, from the advocate, from, from a victim perspective to an empowered perspective. Professor Walzer, who was a, a, a political philosophy um, uh, professor at Princeton, who's retired now, he shares that there are two dimensions to the pace of change in the Exodus story. Here again is the argument for gradualism, he writes. Physically, the escape from Egypt is sudden, glorious, complete, Spiritually and politically, however, it is very slow, a matter of two steps forward, one step back. I want to stress this is a lesson from the Exodus experience again and again, right? Some physical changes happen incredibly quick, right? Um, that's the whole story of matzah, why we have to eat matzah, because of how quick this change happened. And yet there's, there's another dimension spiritually and politically that is very slow. Think about what just happened in bank regulation over the last few days, right? Silicon Valley Bank was taken over by the government, closed the bank. And then Signature Bank in New York, the third largest bank in the history of America to ever be closed by the, by the government, right? These were massive changes that happened very quickly. Part of it is due because in 2018, the Trump administration, with the Democrats' support as well, both parties, wanted to empower medium-sized banks. Um, to compete with large banks. So they deregulated medium-sized banks. And th that deregulation led to risky activity, which me meant the bank needs to bail out the people who have deposits in these banks. The owners, of course, are going to suffer. I'm actually um, um, friends with um, the, the the owner, the founder of Signature Bank. He's a, he's a really good dude and a nice Jewish man on the Upper East Side. I feel bad for him what happened here. Um, in any case... Um, uh, uh, what happened here is a case of really quick uh, closing of banks and a, a ton of fear. And that's why the, the federal government right now is trying to assure, right, um, depositors, assure the country that their deposits are safe. Otherwise, people are going to try to pull their deposits out, which is why this bank closed. When people want to pull their deposits out too quickly and they can't do that, uh, they can't they can't handle it. The bank the bank the bank collapses. In any case, there's a longer term strategy that has to happen in terms of regulation processes, the, the balance between freedom, um, financial freedom and and you know government governmental regulation and how people think about their economic security. And so there's a spiritual, political, psychological dimension which is separate from really fast things that happen. This is happening all the time. Think about Russia, Ukraine, Russia, you invaded Ukraine. The world had no idea what was going on, um, you know, and was just amazed. And now a year later, we're still kind of unpacking, like making sense of this. And so there's this, these different these different steps here. We can't just expect big miracles and massive paradigm shifting changes in society. Rather, we need to stay focused on the work of today 
a well-known powerful midrash it reminds us of how redemption cannot come if we stop our daily work. You may remember this beautiful midrash. Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai used to say, if there's a sapling in your hand, when they say to you, oh, behold, Mashiach has come, complete planting the sapling, and then go and welcome the Messiah, right? What might you have thought? You might have thought, Mashiach's here. Oh, work is done. Running to greet, greet the Messiah, right? We're all done, right? Says, no, no, don't stop your work. And, we, you know, um, uh, we talked about this like 30 weeks ago. Um, but just thinking about that idea that if we stop the work, the Messiah disappears, right? The, 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 fast, um, the, the fast messianic experience, so to speak, um, cannot exist without um, the work dimension alongside of it. In a similar vein, a rabbi in Chicago writes of his own experience. Last night I was in the midst of delivering an online shira class on the subject of Hanukkah and Kiddush Hashem. I had reached the words of the Rambam in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah when a text message flashed across my computer screen that said, Baruch Dayan Hayamet Rabbi Schwartz. This picture here is, um, was a man uh, in his 90s, really um, uh, a, a good man, Rabbi Gedalia Dov Schwartz, who was the head of the rabbinical court in Chicago and did a lot of good things in that role. For a split second, I was unsure what to do. He's teaching this class while he got this text to apologize and cancel the class, to share the news that that his mentor had died, and then and, and then teach or simply to plow ahead and deliver the class. He wasn't sure. But then just as quickly, I thought of what he would do. And I decided to say nothing, teach the class, and only afterward did I share the terrible news with those who had joined. I also think of former President George Bush II, um, whether we loved him or hated him or something in between, of when he was informed in this, I think he was in a student a student classroom, like a, reading a book to a, a classroom, when he was informed of 9-11. And you can see his face when this is told, and yet he, he kind of finishes up his activity in there, um, you know, before he leaves. And there's a lot of cases like that of kind of watching after the fact, the face of someone who's being informed of something that just happened and kind of how they kind of get through this last stage. So it's kind of like being whispered in, the, in one's ear, Mashiach is here, and yet going on with the lesson. Um, and so this is, this is relevant as we think about our commitment to the slow process alongside rapid change, right? And having just come out of COVID, we know this so well, like we heard it was here, it took society a long time to adapt. It took us a long time to figure out, like, what do I do now? How do I, like, do Zoom for my kids? How do I do work while my kid is doing Zoom at school, right? And, like, is that even possible? And masks and vaccines and community and shul and Rosh Hashanah? Like, what are we going to do? And, like, quick changes and then kind of a long-term educational process. On the other hand, sometimes we need radical responses to unique opportunities, Consider this crucial moment in Moshe's development, where he quickly and boldly responded to suffering and injustice, right? Talked about this uh, just last week. It happened in those days that Moshe grew up and went out to his brethren and observed their, their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a fellow Hebrew man. He turned this way and that and saw there was no man. So he struck down the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand, right? He saw this injustice and he needed to act quickly. Now, that's pretty scary to act in quickly because, you know, um, you might get yourself in trouble. <clears throat> but on the other hand, this man's life's at stake. He's going to kill the slave if he doesn't intervene. So on the one hand, he wants to protect himself. On the other hand, he wants to save a life. What do you do in a moment like that? <clears throat> right. What do you do if you're a bystander and you see somebody being attacked in the street and you know that calling 911 won't be enough? Moshe apparently would have preferred that someone else intervene here. But what he saw... There wasn't anyone who could. He did what needed to be done. Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein reflected on how a student of Talmud could be lacking alacrity in a way that can dull their moral clarity. A couple, a couple of years after we moved to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem, I was once walking with my family in the Beit Yisrael neighborhood where Rabbi Isra Zalman Meltzer used to live. For the most part, it consists of narrow, narrow alleys. We came to a corner and found a merchant stuck there with his car. The question came up as to how to help him. It was a clear case of prika uteina, helping one load or unload their burden with their donkey. There were some youngsters there from the neighborhood who, judging by their looks, were probably 10 or 11 years old. They saw this merchant was not wearing a kippah, 
Right? This was not an, um, a religious Jewish man. So they began a whole pill pool based on the Gemara and Pesachim, right? these ultra-Orthodox kids, about whether they should help this secular man or not. They said if he walks around bareheaded, presumably he doesn't separate trumot or maiserot, so he's probably suspect of eating and selling on type produce. They were going through this whole this ta- Talmudic discourse on whether they should help this guy. I wrote Rav Soloveitchik a letter at the time. That that happens to be this this author's father-in-law, Rabbi Lichtenstein's father-in-law, and I told him of the incident. I ended with the comment: "Oh, children of that age from our camp would not have known the Gemara." But they would have helped him. My feeling then was, why Ribona Sha'olam? Why God must this be our choice? Can't we find children who would have both helped him and still know the Gemara? Do we have to choose? I hope not. I believe not. If forced to choose, however, I would have no doubts where my loyalties lie. I prefer that they know less Gemara, but help him. Now, Rabbi, Rabbi Lichtenstein was a person who had invested his whole life in the Beit Midrash, in this Right? Nonetheless, he knew that the essence of being a Torah Jew is responding quickly and immediately when the opportunity arises. Just to unpack the story, in case it was a little kind of winding, um, essentially, there were some um, extremely religious kids who were very fluent in Talmudic literacy and, um, and didn't help this man because of that. Because they, they you know, and he says, oh, I wish we had kids who were Jewish, Jewishly literate and we're quick to act people, um, quick to act to help people. But if I had to choose between those two, I would choose they know less Torah, but help, right? Now, that is the predicament of our day. Um, we have a whole lot of liberal Jews who don't know a lot of Torah, by and large, right? The assimilated American Jewish community that essentially didn't go to day school, didn't um, maybe even go to Sunday school, d- don't even know the Aleph Bet, more or less, and are just not Jewishly literate. But but by and large, hold good values and want to help people and do good things in the world. And then we have a, we have a growing a phenomenon of orthodoxy that knows a whole lot of Torah. They've gone to day school. They went to yeshiva in Israel for a bunch of years. They're like fluent in Hebrew, fluent in Talmud, right? No hal- halakha back and forth, but by and large reject universalism and think that, you know, not so clear I should help a stranger. Like I should be a little more parochial in my own community. Of course, I'm making generalizations about liberal Jews. Of course, I'm making generalizations about Orthodox Jews. But those are real problems. The assimilation of liberal Jewish America that doesn't know a lot of, of uh, doesn't have a strong Jewish education, and a form of Orthodoxy that is such a form, strong form of a Jewish education that in many ways has been perverted to kind of bracket this need to quickly help someone unless they're in your own ideological camp, in your own parochial group. And that is one of the things we're here to do at BBM, not only to build bridges between these camps, but to increase Jewish literacy among more liberal Jews and to challenge more traditional Judaism towards a more universalistic approach. Um, in any case, Rabbi Lichtenstein observed that, and we see that playing out in Israel right now. Right now in Israel, we see settlers and Haredim who are willing to throw out the whole modern conventions of democracy, more or less, in, in, in a vision of Torah, right, which is anti-modern. And, um, and then we see a whole liberal establishment of Israel that by and large wants to reject that and says, like, we choose democracy over religion, or at least your form of religion. And um, and so we see this playing out in American Jewish life. We see this playing out in, in Israeli political scene. And we can see this playing out in our own lives, once again, of how our own ideology blocks us from acting quickly with what we know to be right. It's not just what they do. It's what we do. It's what we do. We, we, we sometimes get stuck in not acting quick enough. Okay, so to conclude here, friends, it's not always so easy, but we can train ourselves to be zrizim, we quick, quick actors, so that we may, may be ready to perform the mitzvot with alacrity and to answer the call to help others when called upon to do so. May we both individually and as a collective, through engaging this and all acts of chesed, we have studied in, in our time, do our share of tikkun olam, making this world a better place. You know, we did a session with one of my teachers, Rabbi Avi Weiss, a few days ago. And one of the things he said was um, how much he admires his younger self. He says, look, I, I'm an older fellow now. He's almost 80. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't take the kind of risks I used to take. But I'm so glad that I used to, right? Because I wouldn't do those anymore. 
And it's important to embrace different life stages. And that's not consistent. It's not that everyone young should take risks and folks who are older should not. Could be the opposite. Maybe you're young and not financially secure and you can't take risks. And maybe you have financial security later and you can't take risks. Or a whole bunch of other factors. Maybe you're not confident in your 20s and you're confident in your 70s. Or, or again, the opposite. And so there's different life stages on how we embrace risk, how we move quickly versus slowly, how we're willing to make mistakes and not. It's, you know, uh, oftentimes it's said, although it's certainly not ubiquitous, that older people don't care as much what people think about them. I just say what I feel. I don't care as much as when I was young about what people thought of me. That's not an unrare thing I hear from, from you know, from seniors in a sense of like, I'm just going to do what's right. I don't care what people think. Whereas younger people are very concerned about their image. Of course, not always true. Could be the opposite as well. Younger people might be more brash and, and, and the opposite. And so we see here this idea of different times of our lives, embracing different paces for change, different paces for how we respond to things, different willingness or tolerance for mistakes in our lives, right? We know moving quickly will make mean we're going to make mistakes. We're going to offend some people if you move really quick. Is it worth it? Do I want to be slow and methodical at this stage of my life? Do I want to move fast and then clean up the mess after? Right. And um, um, and if we look back at our lives, if we examine, maybe we want to go back and look at five times in our life, we moved really quickly on a decision. And how did it turn out? Right. What what was the gain in those five times when I made a really fast decision? What were the losses and, and how, did, how did they weigh out against each other? When we trust our gut to move quickly, has it worked out well for us or not? So, um, um, uh, you know, just a closing story before I, I open up the conversation, which is, you know, I, one, one case I think here, and sorry to bring up a kind of a, a more militant example. I don't love militant examples, but I think the point comes across. Roe Klein was a 19-year-old Israeli, and when a grenade was thrown at his unit, he immediately threw himself upon the grenade and said what Jewish martyrs have said throughout history, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And then he blew up and he saved his whole unit. And that's not an, an, a, that's an incredibly rare thing. Um, and he had made the decision, like, I, I'm a teenager, but if I have the rare moment where I can save over a dozen lives around me, I'm willing to give my life. Like, he just had that clarity. And I think part of being able to move quick not, not in giving our life, hopefully, but in any case, we need to move quick, is already having the clarity of what we're willing to sacrifice. Every, uh, almost all of us, if we saw our child in front of a bus, would be willing to throw ourselves in front of the bus. Right? We have that clarity, I think. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other cases where we don't have clarity. And are we willing to move quickly? And we may have to have already engaged in a thought process when we're move, willing to move quickly and when not. Um, but I heard this story out of Jerusalem just recently, that there was an 85-year-old man who owned a jewelry shop, and a seven-year-old girl walked into the jewelry shop, and she um, she told the, the jewelry shop owner that she'd like to buy um, his nicest bracelet. And she pointed behind the counter and pointed to a bracelet that might have cost about $5,000. And, um, and, and the owner of the jewelry shop um, you know, looked at the girl and was surprised and said, well, who, who would you like to buy this for? And she said, well, uh, my parents died when I was very young, so I'd like to buy this for my older sister. And, um, and she said, don't worry, I'm prepared to pay for this. And she pulled out eight shekel and seven diagarot. And the owner of the jewelry shop looked at this seven-year-old girl and looked at this $5,000 bracelet and looked at the seven shekel, seven diagarot, roughly like uh, $2, and said, well, that's, that's exactly the cost of this bracelet. And slid the, the bracelet across the counter to the, to the little girl. And the next day, the older sister runs into the jewelry shop. I'm so sorry. My sister must have robbed you or deceived you. I'm so sorry. Please take back this bracelet. Don't tell anyone that my sister you know, came in and did this. And the owner of the jewelry shop said, no, no. You see, my wife passed away a few years ago. And ever since then, no, I'm, I've noticed that nobody even looks me in the eye when they come into the jewelry shop. They just buy their jewelry and it's all transactional. Your sister paid seven shekel, 80 80 agarot and one broken heart. She paid in full, right? There are these moments where someone is right in front of us and um, and we can see them. We can see them and we can respond to them. And that doesn't only require us to be able to see people right in front of us. It requires us to have already made a commitment that we want to see people in front of us. Not only that we want to see them, but we're prepared to 
sometimes respond when they emerge in front of us. Okay, friends, I'm going to pause there. We are going to save time for in our last three minutes that our great Alex Kramer um, is going to lead us in a kidu. She's going to say a break for your We're all going to make a little l'chaim for our siyum, our celebration of completing our 40 units of on chesed. But before we get to that, um, I'd love to hear pe- folks' perspectives on this topic of zrizut or anything related to chesed today. Hi, hi, Lauren. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for everybody who responded to my request for good thoughts from my poor pussy cat. I hope she gets through it. Um, it's interesting because, you know, when you think of someone like Roe Klein, who's like such a hero, it's just, wow. I mean, that's like acting on the spur of the moment with hardly even thinking. I think it's adrenaline, the same thing, you know, with, you know, a mother with a child rushing to emerge, anything like that. And I think there's different, um, different aspects to Ziri Zut. I mean, I know I should be already cleaning my place for Pesach, you know, and I hate doing it. And I'm already panicking, which is a waste of energy. But there's some things that you can somehow do it and other things I know now that I'm older, I'm not so quite back. My get up and go got up and left. But then you have to, um, it's funny because I've been working on two things lately, equanimity and Ziri Zut. And the equanimity is like the, the pause between the replying. And I have to do that more towards speech. And the Ziri Zut is like, don't pause, act, but think and act. And um, maybe it takes a lifetime to get that mixture, have the energy and the thought. But anyways, that's what I have to say. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Um, And what do we do with that overwhelming feeling of those things that are on our to-do list that, um, you know, some of us will kind of build out a plan. Maybe we clean one drawer a day, you know, maybe we clean one shelf a day. And some of us are going to have that Sunday before Pesach that's going to be just a really full day. Um, I, I think back to my childhood, my brother, who is better than me at everything. He is stronger and smarter and better looking and just about everything he's better at. He's two years older than me. Um, And he was a a good model of someone I was always kind of chasing after as a kid. He was a last minute guy. I mean, he had a test. He would just stay up till like late in the night and just get an A on the test. Uh, I couldn't do that. I would prepare for like a week before the test and do a little hour each night and I'd get a B. You know, <laughs> and uh, but I think back to that all the time of just how fr- from very early in childhood, our, our 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 relationships to procrastination or last minute were very different and how that related to our stress and how that related to our performance. And, um, you know, he's someone who knows how to get up and go at the right minute. And I'm someone who likes to space things out, think about it, analyze it, you know, calendar it, schedule it, all that good stuff. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, and Pesach is a great example. And and I wonder, actually, if a big part of that um, demand is related to kind of the challenge of, of Zrizut that, that's built into the holiday Pesach, like almost preparing us to once again learn how to, um, you know, kind of lift a burden like that. So anyways, Lauren, I hope however you do your Pesach preparations, that it can be joyful for you because I know many people find it um, really burdensome and, you know, it it of course can be financially burdensome, physically burdensome. I hope there can be some joy in there for you also. Yeah. Thank you. Aglaia. Hi, Aglaia. Okay, depending on how, okay, and I'm really sorry if I start having a coughing fit in this in the middle of this because I haven't been feeling well for a while. But long story short, though, depending on how willing people are to just bear with me for a second. Okay, so one of the reasons why grad school, like, you know, my dissertation wasn't exactly the happiest time in my life was because I had some very strange ideas. Um, like I said, I cited differential equations and quantum theory for my dissertation. The reason why was because I was trying to demonstrate, okay, just like I said, bear with me, okay, demonstrate why revolutions fail. And so in the case of the French Revolution, how I used it was, okay, so the quantum theory, you have matter, antimatter, and they cancel each other out. French failed to find the anti to what was causing problems for their society. Now, differential equations, any DiffieQ fans in the room? Any DiffieQ fans? 
Okay, never mind. Okay, but long story short, though, you can use there's um the uniqueness theorem says problems have one general solution and then they have particular solutions. Okay, like several different particular solutions depending on the circumstances. So what I was putting together was a general solution is like your antithesis, and your particular solutions are like your short term. Uh, your, you know, like, yeah, your antithesis is your long-term solution. Your particular solutions are your short-term solutions. Now, here's the problem. Short-term solutions, basically depending on a lot of the, you know, particulars of the, you know, situation, a lot of the time they end up failing because they put, they're like, they put the same issues in, okay? So if you, for instance, say, just hypothetically, you're the French Revolution and you're worried about okay, we want to make a nonviolent society, but then everything you do is based on violence. Well, of course, you're going to put the exact same regime up that you had before. You should have found something else. Here's the problem. Some, and what I'm getting at here, a lot of problems, if we're talking social problems, cannot be solved with our short-term solutions because of the fact a lot of the time the short-term solutions are just kind of repackaging you know, our society in a nice, prettier package, but it's still repackaging. Long-term solutions have to actually like go through and like start breaking down a lot of things. People are not patient enough for this. So I don't know, there has to be like, what do we do for the tension between everyone wants a short-term solution, 12 steps to make your, you know, 12 steps, a racist anonymous, you're not going to be a racist anymore after you do these 12 steps. You can't do that. Okay, that's not going to work. Okay, one oh, okay. just one follow up question, Aglaia. Um, how do you think of the American Revolution as being a failure? Okay, the American Revolution, um, kind of the same way. What did they put up? They put kind of an aristocracy up. The meritocracy that they were trying to come up with, um, you know, just completely. They just put the same thing, and then they put out this, you know, phony kind of lie about. Well, if you are a white male, you can become one of this aristocracy at some point. Mm -hmm. but it's not exactly likely to happen. Yeah, and thank you. I, I really appreciate your thinking about the history of political change mm -hmm. in, in regards to the short-term versus long-term gain, mm -hmm. um, because I think that I, I think that it really is an important point. I'll give an example, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we have various political views on this. You know, the Biden administration just reversed its commitment on drilling in Alaska. Um, now, I understand people want, you know, to politically survive, people want to pay less at the pump. Right. People want, um, you know, access to more cheap oil. And yet um, there's a reason there was a long term commitment towards not drilling. Right. And and a, a lot of examples like this of what we're willing to have short term versus long term. Now, I, I mentioned a guy in the past and I'll mention him again, although uh, is McCaskill. Mac McCaskill, a Scottish philosopher who's the founder of long termism, says that people of the future matter more than people of the current because there's going to be much more of them. And how do we think about long-term impacts more than just the short-term gains as it relates to a whole bunch of decisions we're making now that might be economically beneficial now, but have a really bad consequence 50 years from now in, in a whole on a whole bunch of levels. Now, Marty Linsky and Ron Heifetz, the leadership gurus, um, talk about what Aglaia is referring to here as technical versus adaptive change. Technical change, we all know what that looks like. It's just a technical fix that is a, is um gives a short ter term reward it's a band-aid solution um an adaptive shift is uh something much longer term and is something that requires people to kind of rethink and the systems to restructure how they operate it's not just replacing this tyrant with that tyrant right in revolutions right in the arab spring we saw what happened yeah you got a democracy but was it really was the tyrant any less bad necessarily any less dangerous and so um there is this whole fallacy out there that immediate quick revolutions are going to get us what we want. And in fact, it can be very dangerous. So I appreciate you flagging that. And I would encourage people to think about that for their own lives, too, about how kind of the personal attempt for overnight changes, like anyone who's selling overnight, bet the, you're going to have the perfect body. Overnight, you're going to have the perfect health. You're going to have the total success, right? Those overnight cells of like, you can become their best you tomorrow, right? As opposed to kind of this, um, this kind of um, you know, adaptive approach. So yes, okay, thank you so much. Who, uh, Steve Chauvin. Hi, Steve Chauvin. Hi. Uh, I was just thinking of what, what, what you said and, and from a practicality standpoint, how would the creator of that product promising something overnight 
not promising something overnight would make one sale. So there, there, there is uh, a a realistic aspect to things like that. Yeah, Steve, thanks for saying that because um, you know we live in that world. We live in that world where a world of marketing, a world of sales, a world where we do have to con- you know convince people that what we're selling is going to change their lives quickly. Um, that's what every politician campaigns on um, and that all of us get duped by, you know, um, th- that that any politician is capable of creating immediate, you know, lasting transformative change. Um, and that's what th- the sellers of products do. And so, Steve, what do we do with that? What do we do with that, um, that, that, that reality? We grow up, get older and realize what's realistic and not. <laughs> and that's the important that's the importance of getting to be 80. You sometimes can accept the slowness of change. Yeah, okay, great, great. Love that. Okay, Sarah, then Gary. Um, yeah, I as we were talking about it, I thought, well, surgery. Sure, surgery is often one of those things where you need to immediately act and it can make a tremendous change, but then the body has to recover from Mm -hmm. the surgery and it may mean a long-term change in the whole body's physiology how it adapts in the world there can Mm -hmm. be all sorts of long-term repercussions and acting rapidly may not always even give you what you wanted you may not save that that patient you you may not save the family it's the question that I asked earlier was, so how do we balance out looking sort of at that long term, at seeing what the ramifications are of an act and still having that long, that longing to act, to be, to do what we believe is for the long term good, mm-hmm. for the good of all beings for the good of our own soul. Um, it, that's a really tough balance. Mm-hmm. And equanimity alone, I wish, would give me the answer. Mm-hmm. But um, it doesn't. And, and unlike the giraffe who has that long neck and can see far away and yet pick and harm whatever is nearby and dangerous, we don't have quite the same ability. Um, yes. If I may jump in here just really quickly. Okay, bef- I don't want to monopolize or anything like that, though. But the reason why I like went about it in my approach, though, was that like it really takes a lot of very, very like hard introspection to find that. That's what, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. And uh, what you're saying and what Sarah's saying here. And in Pirkei it says um, that that's the deepest form of wisdom is being able to come to see the consequence of choices, right? Being able to think towards the future, ultimately, being able to think towards the long-term, um, you know, when we're when we're choosing to live as we do. And yet, like, it is so hard, especially for young people to think, like, birth happens immediately. Like a child pops out and is born, and it takes a long time to learn how to be a parent right? You get married, you get married in like 30 seconds, like a ring goes on, you're married. It's a long term to learn how to be a spouse. You get a medical degree and you walk out that, you know, you walk off with that diploma and it takes, now you're on call for a bunch of decades, right? And, you know, and adapting to that. And um, yeah, and, you know, I think that's worth us reflecting on, on um, kind of um, uh, from, from the perspective of kindness, not just about our own personal life decisions, although that's valuable, the perspective of kindness, like how am I doing immediate acts of kindness and how am I thinking about like kindness in the long-term impact? Okay, over to Gary, then Eric. Uh, I'm having issues with the uh, internet, so hopefully you can hear me. I hear you great. Right. Well, uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, The way we uh, decided, uh, uh, or I should have gotten out of the... uh, 
the issue of cleaning and preparing for Pesach with the house is we just go to our grandkids each year. <laughs> we show up two days and help, and then we don't have to deal with all the cleaning and changing okay. dishes. Well done. So uh, benefit of having grandkids that live out of state. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, you know, I want to go back to, I think you said something early uh, about uh, uh, buying things or what have you is that I think we've just come into a society of overanalyzing. We want to, we, we, we don't want to make quick decisions because we're so inundated with media. Uh, and I just use my wife, but I don't think it's as an example, I don't think it's any different. You, you go to buy something on Amazon and next thing you know, you're looking at uh, an hour later to decide which is the best pair of shoes to buy or, or what organization you want to give to. Is it right? Is it wrong? Uh, who's, who's uh, underwriting this organization rather than just doing the right thing. And we've talked about that, you know, in previous, in, in previous things, uh, uh, do you give uh, somebody's on the street? Do you, well, should I give him money or should I not? Uh, is it for drugs or is the guy just hungry? Uh, and I just think this, this political over analyzing world is, has become a, a detriment uh, to nonprofits uh, and 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 other organizations that just do the right thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not asking anybody to go out and and put their life on the line, but we are asking them to be kind and to be gentle and 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 don't overanalyze uh, what uh, what the necessary the situation is, which is something maybe different in the long run, but in the short run. Uh, I, I think uh, I may have mentioned the story again. Uh, if, a, if a very Haredi man walks down the street and there's a beggar and he gives, uh, you know, a few shekels and another man walks by who, who's very secular and pulls out a hundred dollar bill and throws, them in, throws it in his pot, uh, who did the right thing? You know, uh, it doesn't matter why the the non sec why the secular person gave, but a whole lot more food is bought with a hundred bucks, a hundred shekels than with two shekels. Uh, and it kind of goes back to that story that you you mentioned at the at the beginning of, of the the Torah chacham that overanalyze should they give or sh or should they. Mm -hmm. or should they not give. Uh, very, very cool, Gary. Well, first of all, um, maybe I'll join you at your grandkids for Pesach. <laughs> that sounds really nice. Uh, maybe we'll all come. See if yeah, they can sure. fit us all Why in not? there. <laughs> um, and yeah, your point about overanalyzing is great. I mean, we all know how great it is to be analytical and to be really intentional and make smart choices and think carefully about what we're doing. And and we're going to get to this in our Kant and Hume debate, right? I mean, to kind of oversimplify for a moment, like, you know, Hume's critique essentially that you know reason is just is reason is just there to justify what we already are going to do based upon our our emotions um that we already kind of have a sense in our emotions as to what we're committed to and reason is after the fact we're just justifying what we already want to do and um this happens all the time i i think back when i in, when i was in when i was dating and after dates, when I was confused on what to do, I would make these pro-con lists. Oh, the person was very nice, but they want to live in this city. And, you know, I felt connected to them, but they're going to be in this career. And, you know, uh, I'm religious like this and they're religious like that. But again, they were very nice. And I would do, and, then, and I get to the point of like, huh, my like, gosh, like, like, just listen to your gut. Go like, why are you making these feats about overanalyzing whether you like this, you want to go on another date with this person or not, you know? But it's a muscle. We have to develop the muscle of being able to, being able to not overanalyze, just kind of flow a little bit more. But one of the problems for modern people is what is the greatest sin for a modern person? Being duped. We hate being duped. We hate voting for the person who comes out to be a crook. We hate buying the product that turns out to be less good than the other one. We hate, right, donating to the cause that it turns out was not, you know, 50% of it was going to the development professional. But we hate being duped, and so we are skeptical. And yet, how can you do good if, if we're always afraid of being duped? How can we do good if we're always worried about being con, right? And so, um, uh, you know, it is... It is a great um, it is a great muscle for us to learn how to be analytical and yet not overanalyze decisions that we already kind of know what to do, right? We don't have to like you know read read look at every cereal box, you know, like spend a minute in the cereal aisle rather than tw fifteen minutes. Right? Okay, Eric, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I might have a different perspective, and I'm going to maybe refrain from questions on this last session. Um, 
I think you saved the best for last in the context that this wasn't uh, the most exciting uh, uh, brief, but I think this was the hardest. I think there are people that struggle with this topic. Um, big, I'm, I'm in a profession where this is a very, very difficult thing. And people have quit their jobs because it's, it's even though they might have a very big muscle, as you said, and they might overanalyze, it's it's living with the decisions of what is the what is the right action to make that is the doing the, the most right, um, whether it's acting immediately or taking time. I've learned from these from your citations that while there is there are courses of actions, there is a lack of consensus, and that's what I've always had trouble with the subject is that there's a lack of consensus in Judaism on how to proceed because it's always case by case basis. And I, I think people here have given great examples. Um, I think this is gonna be one of the most difficult subjects moving forward for our generation and how we have new scholars to add on to this subject is yeah. even gonna make this even more difficult on, on its application on very different levels. So, but I wanna say thank you for everyone's input on this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, you know, um, so on the one hand, we see the value, like, if somebody is sick, or someone has a loved one who's died, we know the value of immediately acting, like, just call them. Don't say, do they want me to call them? Is this the right time to call them? Just call them. On the other hand, we might say, wait a minute, maybe you should think about it, right? Is this the right time to call? How should I call? Right. And many people don't call because they just overanalyze it. Ah, maybe I'm not close enough to call them. Maybe it's the wrong time to call them. Maybe I shouldn't visit them in the hospital. Do they really want to visit? Maybe I just go. Right. And um, and knowing when to you know, remove those barriers. Right. We see an earthquake and we're just going to donate right away to it. Do I want to look and analyze which of the 10 groups uh, uh, fundraising for the earthquake is the most effective? Well, it might be good to do that. So it's going to help the most. Or we might just not get to it if we do that. And we might not have access to the perfect information. We might just give to the one that we've trusted in the past. One of the values of Jewish learning, I think, is thinking about moral predicaments before they arrive. And so that we have already thought through so that when we are quick to act, we're not being impulsive. I've thought about this moment, even though it never arrived before. And here it is. And now in this moment, I'm ready to act. And it's not impulsive. I'm, I'm acting quickly, but not impulsively. Because I've thought through this, right? That is a great part of a moral, a morally reflective life is that I'm prepared for the morally unpredictable. Um, yes. Okay. Over to you, Ethan. Hi, hey, Rabbi. Uh, building off of Eric's point, I am wondering if in the amazing accomplishment of putting together 40 weeks of content and programming on kindness, which I want to take a moment to applaud you for doing. Um, it's pretty incredible. And I have really enjoyed being a part of this class. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a vote um, to you. I, I'm wondering if there was any sense in your programming of the 40 weeks of which topics of kindness do we need to get to first quickly and which topics of kindness do we need to ponder and wait for on the end and maybe any other general reflections that you might have at the end of this 40 weeks of, of kindness. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. So um, as a reminder, I'm going to kind of read through the list because most of you have been fully in this journey. Um, and I know many of you are on the podcast listening side of this, as I've learned, um, who are not in the room. But I'm going to read through the list just kind of remind us of this journey a little bit. So the first category was kindness towards specific individuals. And there were 12 classes in that. We did Bikor Khalim, Visiting the Sick, Shibud Aim, honoring parents. Ezra Ladalim, supporting the poor and lifting up the Don truck. De'agala Yeladim, caring for children. Ahava Tager, loving the stranger. Kivura Tametim, burying the dead. De'agala Yetomim, caring for vulnerable children. Timichut Kala supporting brides and grooms. De'agala Amanot, caring for widows. Shalom Bayit, maintaining peace in the home. Hidur Pene Zakain, respecting the elderly. Nichum Avelim, comforting mourners. That was towards specific individuals. That's oftentimes how we think of kindness. Like, up oh, there's this person right in front of me, and I'm going to be nice to them. I'm going to do something for them. And that person I see is sick. Can I get you some soup? That child needs me to help them work with their math homework. I'm going to help them. Our second kind category was kindness toward all individuals, right? Not just a specific individual. 
We did Diyun L'chaschut, judging favorably. Dibor Yafe, speaking kindly. Ahavat Reyacha, loving your neighbor. Arvut, taking responsibility of our community. Redifat Shalom, pursuing peace in the world, locally and, and, and globally. Gimelut Chasadim, engaging in random acts of kindness. Derech Eretz, displaying good manners. Redifat Emet, pursuing truth. Savlanut, being patient. Hakarat Etov, expressing gratitude. Ichpatiut le'acherim, reaching out to others, and shitshituf pe'ula, sharing. That was our second category. Our third category only had two classes. That was kindness through restraint, as, a, as opposed to kindness through doing, but through restraining. One was miniat nekama, not taking revenge. The second is miniat mitchell, not placing a stumbling block before the blind. Then we had care for the environment, which was shmirat teva, guarding the earth, and Chemla Labale Chaim, displaying compassion for animals. And our last category, which we just completed, had 11 classes. And this was about self improvement, kindness through our own kind of uh, self development. Anava, walking humbly. Miniat Kas, restraining anger. Haf Chatat De'aga, reducing worry. Simcha, emanating joy. Miniat Atzlanut, avoiding laziness. I know that was a. Uh, that was a loaded one. Tikva, dechiat yeush, which is being hopeful or rejecting despair. Yira, living with awe. Emuna ubitachon, holding faith and trust. Menucha tenefesh, achieving equanimity. Omet, striving for courage. Hit lamdut, last week constantly learning. And today, zrizut, being quick to act on what is right. And yes, I think that um, part of the ordering here was just not only thinking about our relationship to specific others, types of others, to the world that's not human, um, and then thinking through ourselves, changing ourselves in order to have that impact in the world. Um, but it didn't really have any relationship to kind of, um, you know, this this pace of change issue, which we concluded on. Um, but I do just want to um, express my gratitude to each of you for being like so incredibly attentive um, and present and challenging of the ideas to help me think through this more deeply and open-hearted and vulnerable and thinking about this for yourself. This is not intended to be like an intellectual um, acrobatics, but intended to just be a space of reflection where we can all think about how to develop a more kind world on how we can think about everything we do as, as a pathway towards kindness. Our jobs, our families, our friendships, our homes, our, con our consumerism, our political choices, our economic choices, our, our entertainment choices, everything is a pathway towards elevating other people around us um, to, to foster a more kind world. And um, I hope you will consider joining in this next session, which is going to look in some ways through the same lens, but through these thinkers and how it, how it helps us to think ideologically, philosophically, intellectually, but always, always with this awareness that um, everything has to be done with kindness. And, and that um, each of us can grow in this arena. And so I want to invite you to, to pick up something next to you, whether you have a drink or a snack or a cake or a, a, a multivitamin um, that we're going to make a l'chaim to, <laughs> um, to celebrate our siyum. A siyum is a completion uh, um, ceremony where we celebrate that, oh my gosh, like, Standing at the gates of heaven, so to speak, wherever we think we're going to be standing, we can say, like, I spent 40 weeks of my life, like, meditating on kindness and how I can live with that. And not many people can say that. And that's a beautiful thing. And now the harder part comes to now live this more deeply and continue to support each other in that. And I know all of you. And so I know all of you already are. So it's hard to go from 10 out of 10 to 11 out of 10. <laughs> but um, I'm going to invite our, our dear friend, Alex Creamer. Uh, in, in gratitude to her for all she did to enable this incredible series um, that she was really behind uh, to lead us in a brave free agafin that we can say amen to and then, you know, and then consume whatever we want to have. Thank you, Rabbi Shmuley. All right, I'll make this quick. Baruch and I Eloheinu Melech HaAlam Bore Pri Agafen. Amen. Um, uh, so friends, uh, my, my, my deep gratitude to you for, for joining this and um, our continued commitment to chesed through the heart. As a reminder, the Torah ends with lamed. It begins with bet, which spells lev, which spells heart. 
all Judaism at the end has to be about heart and soul. It's got to be about sharing our heart and soul with each other and um, fostering a more kind world and not doing it from sacrifice, but doing it from a sense that that's, that's a happy life. A joyful life is one that's infused with kindness. And the more we give, the more we get in that deep, deep spiritual sense. Right. Okay, my dear friends, I hope to see you next week. Thank you so much. God bless.